Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had good lunch. My name is Joanne Moser, and I'm a senior curator of prints and drawings at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I would like to welcome you this afternoon to what I think is a really a rare moment in the history of America, our American Art Symposia. All three speakers on this panel are from outside the United States. One of the goals of considering American art in a global context is to open the discussion to voices that might not regularly be heard or read here. And this panel epitomizes that quest. The papers in this panel were grouped together under the theme modernism and anti-modernism for lack of a more precise topic. And as I read the papers, I thought maybe we should have changed one of those to modernization. But you'll see as you hear the papers why I have that thought. Uh, the theme works better for some of the papers than others, but is not entirely irrelevant to any of them. Most importantly, perhaps, for American audiences, these are new voices and perspectives from these three scholars. And for these visiting scholars, attendance at the symposium provides an important opportunity to meet more American colleagues and hear some of their latest ideas and comparative approaches to the art of the United States. Now, I wish I could make an insightful generalization about the study of American art by foreign scholars, but it is perhaps too soon. 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, it would have been much more difficult to find scholars outside the United States who were studying American art. Instead, I will speculate that opportunities such as those provided by the Terra Foundation fellowships will encourage foreign student scholars to focus on American art, allowing greater contact with the art itself and with the extensive research resources available in the United States and also with American colleagues. Similarly, opportunities for internships in American museums will encourage students to consider the field as a viable option. During the past few years, the number of foreign interns at SAM has increased significantly. And for many of the students, their experience at SAM is their first exposure to American art. Now, during the, the mid-1970s, when I was writing my dissertation on Stanley and William Hayter's Atelier 17 printmaking workshop in New York, I sensed a certain resistance to the topic, since it focused on the impact of a European artist on American printmaking. And I think I felt it so strongly that as I was considering the European-American exchange there, I really totally ignored the uh, South American artists who had come to the workshop. I was so focused on that one aspect. This was a time when scholars were seeking to establish the independence of American art, asking questions like, what is American about American art? It is surely a sign of maturity in the field that such considerations are now secondary to a more nuanced appreciation of the global context in which American art developed. Our first speaker this afternoon will be Takashi Sasaki, Professor of American Studies at Doshisha University, Kyoto, Japan. He has co-authored several books in American cultural history and edited a collection of primary sources in the field. Next will be David Peters Corbett, Professor and Chair of the History of Art at the University of York and Director of the Research School in British Art there. He is one of only a handful of art historians teaching American art in the UK and is currently researching a book on 19th century American landscape and the aesthetic. And finally, we will hear from Luciano Kellis, who is a professor of Italian studies at the Université de Poitiers. And he also is Italian. Uh, yesterday when we were talking about um, uh, Terra Fellows, we mentioned that there were two from France. Well, he is indeed from France now, but he is Italian. He has focused on the reception and reinterpretation of Renaissance art in 20th century culture. He is currently a Terra, Terra Foundation for American Art Senior Fellow at SAM, where he is considering Piera della Francesca's impact on American painting in the 1930s and 40s. 
So I'd like to begin, we're starting a little late, and please hold your questions till the end and we will have the full amount of time for our discussion today. Congratulations for the reopening of the Smithsonian Amer American Art uh, History Museum. And thank you, thank, thank you so much uh, for inviting me uh, all the way from Japan. I really appreciate uh, uh, Adam Gop, uh, Gop, Gopnik's keynote address yesterday. Uh, his framework of the dialectic drama of Franklin, uh, Franklinian empiricism and Edwardian uh, transcendentalism through the experience of the, the through the experience of the other fits very well in my talk on Winslow Homer this afternoon. We know very well that Homer once said uh, that don't uh, let the public poke its nose into my picture. But didn't me uh, poke my idiosyncratic nose into his pictures to celebrate this happy occasion. In this presentation, uh, first, I'd like to do two things. First, explain very briefly how I reached my current research topic, anti-modernism and uh, the archetype. And second, I'll show you my interpretation of Winslow Homer uh, from 1836 to 1910 as late 19th century anti-modernist. <clears throat> First, how I came to this topic. Through my graduate work in American studies at the University of Minnesota uh, in the late 1970s, under the guidance of David Noble, the author of Historians Against History and the Progressive Mind, uh, I learned that we cannot trace the origins of the uh, contemporary sociocultural crisis of the United States, at least to the 1890s. <clears throat> After coming home uh, from the United States, while using a literary text to con continue my study of American culture, I became convinced that American culture consists of two different discourses, a discourse uh, which promotes modernization, prizing rationality and efficiency, and a counter discourse which criticizes uh, the dominant uh, modernization discourse. These two discourses seem to be in a dialectic relationship. At this point in my thinking, David Noble came to Kyoto and gave a series of lectures at the 1980 Kyoto American Studies Summer Seminar under the general title of uh, the anti-generational logic of Anglo-American culture. <clears throat> in this series of lectures, uh, using literary works, Noble demonstrated a dialectic drama of anti-generational logic and generational logic in American history. It is an intellectual drama in which uh, the two main actors are the modern Western historical imagination, which values uh, the conversion experience from the past and trust in the eternal progress of human activities in an unlimited space. And another historical imagination, which appreciates uh, the continuity of the past, present, and the future and respects uh, the, the cyclical rhythm of nature in a limited space. Alan Trachtenberg's visit to Kyoto for the 1985 seminar added a whole new de uh, dimensions uh, to my study of American culture. Trachtenberg's book, Brooklyn Bridge and uh, Reading American photo Photographs, Images as History, encouraged me uh, to expand my textual territory into American art. With his help, I was given an opportunity to study the history of Amer American art at Yale from 1986 to 1987 under Jules D. Brown. My happy encounter with Winslow Homer in Brown's seminar was fortuitously enriched by an exhibition of Homer's watercolor, uh, watercolors at Yale University Art Gallery. <clears throat> it was around this time I had another fo fortunate encounter uh, this one with Jackson Lear's book, No Praise of Grace, Anti-Modernism and uh, the Transformation of American Culture from 1880 to 1920. Lear's book provided me with a key concept in 
analyzing the counter discourse of American culture at the turn of the 20th century. It is true that Lear's concept, anti-modernism, uh, is somehow confusing in terms of the idea of, uh, idea of modernism in art. When Lear says anti-modernism, he means, uh, by the term, the cultural inclination to anti-modernization, uh, which is an important ingredient of modernism in art. Despite uh, some quibbles with his term in this respect, however, I believe that his sophisticated analysis of anti-modernization at the turn of the 20th century is quite useful, especially in terms of the rise of the consumer culture at that time. Finally, Carl Jung's essays, especially the concept of the collective unconscious, uh, his disciple Eric Neumann's The Great Mother, and Mircea Eliade's The Sacred and the Profane, Cosmos and History, and others gave me useful ideas and language in analyzing the symbolic and mythical world of anti-modernism at the turn of the 20th century. Well, that is my intellectual background to today's topic, Winslow Homer, modernization, and uh, the archetype in the late 19th century. Now, in my foreground, that is uh, in the body of my presentation, I hope to show, you, uh, I, I, I hope to show that uh, there was the same kind of anti-modernist uh, reaction in, in the late 19th century in the world of painting as there was in thought, literature, and popular culture. In my abstract, I announced that I would like to discuss Winslow Homer's uh, re uh, response to modernization in comparison with Thomas Eakins. Obviously, however, it is impossible to do that in 20 minutes. So please forgive me uh, that I'll focus on Homer this time. And yet, uh, if we have time in our discussion, uh, I want to make a few observations about Eakins in order to clarify my interpretation of Homer as an anti-modernist. <coughs> now my interpretation of Winslow Homer. A <coughs> hundred years ago, many Americans, including Henry Adams, Mark Twain, and Owen Wister, an inventor of the cowboy novel, viewed with distrust the changes in society caused by industrialism and the rapid growth of cities. Not only intellectuals and writers, but many ordinary people uh, looked back with nostalgia to a romanticized and imaginary past. In doing so, they relied upon what Jungian psychologists call or archetypal images in order to delineate their ideal world. Although Winslow Homer uh, started his career as a magazine illustrator in Boston and New York, he made a tra transition shortly after the Civil War to pastoral landscape painting in New England. Uh, in his later years, while living a semi-secluded life in Proudsneck on the rocky coast of Maine, he devoted himself to the portrayal of primordial nature. <laughs> Moving from the urban scene to the uh, pastoral and from the pastoral to the pr primordial, he changed uh, the subject matter of his uh, painting as well as his scene of his own life. In doing so, uh, he ran uh, completely counter to the tendency of the age uh, and the main current of the world of painting. In this sense, Homer can be thought of as an embodiment of the anti-modernist reaction against the seemingly in irrest irresistible tide of modernization. Now looking at some of the well-known paintings and the drawings by Winslow Homer, I'd like to, excuse me, I forgot to show Egan's precious <laughs> images. Okay, uh, now looking at some of the well-known paintings and the drawings by Winslow Homer, I would like to trace Homer's journey as, a, as an artist in which he discovered the archetypal images of the great mother, the noble savage, and the wise elders. During the period of the 1850s uh, through the 1870s, which was a heyday of engraved, en engraved uh, excuse me, engraved magazine illustrations, Homer was one of the best known illustrators in America. After moving from Boston to New York uh, in 1859, Homer did not completely stop producing the sentimental illustrations. 
He displayed uh, his best talent, however, uh, in portraying scenes from daily life in, American, in, in America's rapidly changing society. Homer mainly worked for Harper's Weekly, just like press photographer today. <laughs> this image, Thanksgiving Day, 1860, the two great classes of society, and uh, Station House Lodgers, 1874, are wood engravings produced during this period. Homer never would have been able to uh, portray with such realism the brutal conditions of urban life and the homeless detainees of the police station without a keen insight into the com complicated situation of the, the structure of the society. Urbanization after the Civil War was accompanied by rapid industrialization, but uh, there are very few paintings or illustrations of American industry by Homer, except for a New England factory life, Bell Time, uh, 1868, and some others. At the very least, we can say that uh, in this illustration, Homer was not uh, basing his hopes and dreams uh, for the future on the course of industrialization. <laughs> Early in his career as a Civil War illustrator, Homer portrayed a variant fighting spirit among the federal troops and contributed greatly to stirring up uh, patriotic fervor in the North. However, although Homer sympathized uh, with the aims of the Union, he was too accustomed to viewing e everything comprehensively to be merely a brilliant uh, propagandist. In the, in the Army of the Potomac, a sharpshooter on picket duty and prisoners uh, from, from the front, 1866, Homer delineated some of the profounder meanings of the war. <clears throat> After the Civil War, until 1880, uh, as though to forget the nightmare of the war, Homer painted a large number of watercolors of children and young girls playing in pastoral settings in New England. It was not only in America that pastoral landscapes were uh, painted in abundance uh, during the latter half of the 1860s and the 1870s. In Europe also, uh, long after the death of Millet in 1875 and, and up until the turn of the century, Van Gogh, Gauguin, and many others were painting pastorals. In the face of the rapid urbanization and industrialization of the end of the century, these artists were trying to rediscover basic human values, which still could be found, at least outwardly, in a simple natural life in rural villages. In America, which suffered the trauma of the Civil War, this tendency was uh, uh, even stronger. People dreamed of an ideal society and imagined that they could rediscover uh, discover it in rural America before the Civil War. For the individual to turn back history means to return to the time of one's childhood. In Homer's pastoral paintings, children and young girls are the main actors, and incidentally, in American literature, there has never been an age in which children played a more important part than in the last third of the 19th century. Mark Twain's and Winslow Homer's heroes were drawn against pastoral backgrounds. Snap the Whip, 1872, and uh, sailing the catboat uh, are typical of the pastorals Homer drew in this period. Homer at this time seemed to have uh, painted only the bright side of the New England countryside and fishing villages, but it is uh, difficult not to uh, detect in the Morning Bell, uh, 1872, a criticism of American society as it changed from agricultural to industrial. From the spring of 1881, uh, for about 20 months, Homer lived in a small English fishing village of Caracoats, and this experience profoundly changed his, uh, his view of, of the world, a uh, Caracoats trick. Uh, <laughs> it was a charming and a uh, peaceful rural health resort in the summer, 
But in the middle of the, war, uh, middle of the winter, it changed to a village on the edge of the uh, laden Carl North Sea, assailed by r raging storms. And there, Homer uh, saw not uh, beautifully dressed uh, lonely girls, but the robust North Sea fisherwomen resolutely confronting the wild sea. Such pastoral titles as the Nooning or the Girl, girl with Laurel uh, vanished, and uh, the life and death struggle uh, with the sea became Homer's uh, new theme. When Homer visited uh, the out of the way village, the inhabitants uh, still followed uh, the traditional 16th century way of fishing, wore the same clothing as, the, as their ancestors, and kept the, the same customs and dialect. In Four Fisherwives, 1881, uh, we do not have the isolation from the surroundings of the women that we see in the morning bell or a young girl at the window. Instead, uh, the overflowing health and beauty of the flower uh, of the four women uh, with their fair complexions and blonde hair recall the goddesses of ancient Greece. The four are the four are united in strong friendship and, tr uh, and trust, and they show a rhythmical harmony in the motion of their bodies and a simple neatness in their dress. Most of the painting is filled with the changeless elements of sea and earth and sky, and spanning uh, these three elements are painted the endlessly repeated labors of men and women. The painting reminds us of the myth of ancient times. According to Mircea Eliade, the function of myth was to give a meaning uh, to the world and to human life by showing models of human activities. The reason why I find mythical element for fisherwives is because uh, the painting reveals to us a model of labor that has not basically changed from ancient times. Furthermore, as Homer continued to paint in color codes, these lovely young women became gradually transformed into strong, majestic fisherwomen who seem to embody the life force of nature. They appear often with their comrades, or sometimes with their children, but finally one solitary woman rises, uh, rises up, towering in a heroic figure on a wave-beaten shore. These women are the source of life, uh, bringing to our minds the act archetype of the great mother. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Inside the Bar, 1883, uh, presents us uh, with exactly such, as, uh, such an archetype. Since her form spans the earth, the sea, and the sky, she, soon, she seems to be a sim symbol of the union of the three basic elements of nature. The fisherwoman woman of the inside the bar reminds me of the depiction of the great mother of Egyptian mythology, the goddess Nut. In the light of rapid urbanization and industrialization, and the strengthening of male dominance in society, how should we interpret Homer's turning to myth and the archetype of the great mother? It seems to me that it was his unconscious revolt against the mainstream ideology of the times that people called progress. To put it in Eliade's terms, Homer feared of the emptiness and chaos of the profane and vulgar current of the time that spread without direction or sense of order or purpose. He sought a sacred space in which to find inner, sp inner peace. Returning to America, Homer withdrew to Prowsnake, took summer vacations in the woods of the Adirondacks, and made winter trips to the Bahamas and Florida. In these places, he painted in nature the archetypal human figures of the old hunter of the, of the woods Adirondack Guide, 1892, and African descents fishing in the Southern Sea, uh, the, tur the Turtle Pound, uh, 1898. But gradually, the human figures disappeared uh, from his paintings, and in his last years, 
uh, Homer uh, developed, he, uh, he devoted himself to the paintings, uh, painting, painting uh, the world of primordial nature. The never ending waves uh, beating on the everlasting rocks of Proust's neck, Northeaster, 1895. In these archetypal images, it would not be difficult to find what David Noble calls generational logic, which appreciates the continuity of the past, present, and the future, and respect the cyclical rhythm of nature. I'm not saying in this presentation uh, that archetypes uh, were an American mode of expression Americans found only at the turn of the 20th century. On the contrary, as Carl Jung says, an archetype is a, spe a specific pattern of the psyche in the collective unconscious, which can be found in all ages and in all people, all, in all places. James Fenimore Cooper's Nati Bampo was an archetypal hunter, and Jackson Pollock's action painting originated in Native America's, Americans sand painting. Nevertheless, uh, unlike European modernists, who are already inventing an, uh, inventing an innovative artistic form to reformulate reality, it seems to me that uh, American writers and artists at the turn of the 20th century, still working in the tradition of realism, heavily relied upon the power of symbols to criticize the in, uh, irresistible power of modernization. To me, Adams, Twain's, Wister's, and Homer's heavy indebtedness to the archetype show the seriousness of their sense of criticism, uh, sense of crisis at the time. To conclude my presentation, <coughs> I must add that uh, the theme of anti-modernism is not a topic unique to American culture at the turn of the 20th century. We can see the similar discourses anywhere in the world where people experienced or are experiencing rapid modernization. Take, for example, Japan at the, at the turn of the 20th century, facing an unprecedented speed of westernization of the Japanese society at that time. A, rep a representative Japanese novelist, Soseki Natsume, wrote in his novel, Kusamakura, uh, and Human Tour, published in 1906, there is, neither, uh, there is nothing else uh, that represents the 20th century civilization so truly as a railway train. It packs hundreds of people in a box, and they have no choice but to be uh, transported all at the same uniform speed in complete disregard of individualism. Anti-modernism is a useful concept uh, in a comparative and cross-cultural studies, and we see in the works of Winslow Homer one important representative expression. Thank you. My voice to, uh, to those of other speakers who have uh, thanked uh, the organizers of the conference, uh, Cynthia Mills and, and uh, Amelia Gerlitz, for the, the, the uh, extraordinary precision and uh, a kindness of the way in which they've dealt with, uh, with their speakers and uh, for the privilege of being here. Uh, one of the, uh, the kindnesses in, in my case was forcing me to do my first ever PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so uh, if anything goes wrong, you can blame Cindy. Um, it's also very nice to, to be in, in Washington, actually, uh, to experience something that I, I've experienced before in the, the six or seven years that I've been trying painfully to educate myself about, about 19th century American painting or American painting before the Armory Show. Uh, which is the extraordinary openness of scholars in that field to a foreigner coming along and uh, bumblingly often, uh, and certainly inaccurately in my case, uh, attempting to, to make sense for themselves of, of this material um, and its considerable visual fascination for me. Um, there is nothing insular, I think was a word somebody else used this morning, there was nothing insular in the, in the way in which the uh, scholarship of the field is open to uh, foreign dialogue, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. This is about, this is comparative, um, and it's about uh, a certain sort of uh, modernist realism as a response to um, social modernization in cities. In the American paint, Ashcan painter John Sloan's 6th Avenue and 30th Street, 
of 1907. A woman pauses at a busy junction. She seems bemused, uncertain, or startled. Behind her passes by turn or thoughtlessly gawp. Litter scuds along the street. Despite the cheap promise of the bar on the corner, the prospect is bleak, tawdry, and unkempt, and the city has a muddy, wintry feel. There are several ways to read the woman's stance, an expression perhaps, but to the authors of the study of the Ashcan artists' metropolitan lives, the scene is a depiction of social cruelty. They write of the woman that her reddened nose, skimpy dress, and confused expression suggests that she's gone out abruptly to buy a pail of beer and now cannot find her way home. The passing spectators mock her confusion without empathy. And the painting as a whole presents, they think, the painful risk of being exposed in public. How I relate to this. The painful risk of being exposed in public <laughs> and the cruelty of the crowd. <laughs> There's something exemplary of Sloan and Ashcan painting in this scene. The combination of the watching audience, slatternly or down at heel but vital, with the bleakly alienating cityscape produces a small image of human violence. But the force of that image is mitigated by the impact of Sloane's compassionate moralism. Be kind to people, he wrote later, reflecting on his art. They wouldn't be alive if they were not fit to live. People are funny enough without our being cruel to them. As you can see. If we turn to the contemporaneous British artist Walter Sickert, who once said, our English fault is to be too nice, distinctions immediately emerge. In a picture like this, the Ennui of 1914, we're still in an urban world. But rather than the dreary streets and drab intersections of so Sloan cityscape, we're confronted by an interior, claustrophobic, perspectively vertiginous, with two alienated figures, each abstracted in their own thoughts, together but alone. This is as much about urban life and as much about social constraint, even embarrassment, as Sloane's painting. But there's none of the intimacy of Sloane, little of his sanguine feeling for low genre or burlesque. These figures take on a monumental, but also more distant cast in Sickert's hands. They become abstractions and exemplars of something mysterious and remote, and not, or not at all, a study of the events of the everyday. It's that, distant, that quality of distance in Sickert that signifies, I think, his resistance to the warm, pungent, intimate sense of humanity that seems to underpin the Sloan. Social interaction in Sickert is tense, more threatening and suggestive than in the American painter, and less concerned with the everyday sufferings of its subjects than with existential realities that exceed the social service, surface of the world. Subtle disturbance, prowling unease, unsettling currents of emotion, or the presence of genuine horror beneath appearance mark out Sickert's depictions of social interaction in the modern city. This is Conversations of 1903-04. A comparison between these representations of popular urban life has often been suggested. Like Sickert, Sloane and his fellow Ashcanners, including Bellows, Hen Hon um, Henry, Henry, Lux, and Ern Shin, dealt with modern metropolitan life and culture in the years around 1900. For this reason, Sickert, the London poet of seedy lodging houses, Dawn, Camden Town of 1909, and the garish, vivid life of the music halls. This is the prompt side wings in the offside mirror of about 1889. Sickert has frequently been mentioned in the same breath as the Ashcan artists. Although the shared preoccupation with the life of the city and its popular energies has, I don't think, ever been systematically explored. The Ashcan artists have different artistic personalities, and I don't have time or space to, here to try and survey them or do justice to the distinctions between Lux and Bellows or Glackens and Shins. So I want to focus on Sloan, since I think his art makes an exemplary contrast with that of Sickert and the other way around. This relationship is all the more intriguing because, as I hope my first two images have suggested, the two painters treat their subject matter in very different ways. In 1900, New York was already assuming its later role as one of the iconic cities of modern life. Those that shape, at particular historical moments, the understanding of what contemporary experience is, and which give it its most intense physical, social, political, economic, and intellectual expressions. 
The city at these moments has, in the words of one observer, become modernity as social action. Waves of mass immigration into New York, economic transformations in both production and consumption, the foundation of the communications industry, the drama of lives lived in the shadow of architecture, which was rapidly exceeding the human scale, and this is Sloan's six o'clock winter of 1912. Poverty and wealth, entertainment and public life, all expressed and justified the city's leading status in that drama of modernization that's played out in America. To roam the streets of New York during the years from the 1890s to the mid-1910s was to be confronted, with, we're told, with a dazzling array of images of the activities of modern life. From couples cruising the theatres and bars, or merely the crowded night, as in Sloan's picture shop window of 1907-8, to the classes mingling in the summer parks, this is Glacken's May Day of Central Park around 1905, and from elegant women on the major shopping streets, Glacken's again, shoppers of 1907, to packed tenements and squalid ghettos, and probably you know what I'm going to show, which is the bellows, cliff dwellers of 1913. It was scenes such as these that formed the subject matter of the Ashcan artists. Trained in newspaper illustration, as many of them had been, they made art which looked at New York from the ground up, as, been, as has been said, seeking to describe the cluttered, active life of individuals within the urban mass, as well as the crowd life of the mass itself, dense, good-humoured on the whole, intensely physical. Sloan's comments on his art as they're relayed in The Gist of Art, the 1939 book, derived from notes taken during his years teaching at the Art Students League, makes it clear that the influence of Robert Henry's emphasis on the painting of life loomed large in the way he conceptualised his work. Teaching at the Chase School, Henry had told his pupils that painting was a means of uniting men, derived from a commitment to the life of the native environment, that is, the streets and cities of urban America. And this is Henry's West 57th Street, New York, of 1902. Sloan, in his teaching, echoes this when he speaks of how the real artist finds beauty in common things and claims for his central belief that an artist gets in contact with real things. Sloan's art depends on this vision of painting as a socially integrative and progressive evocation of the human life of the streets and tenements. But this commitment to earthy fundamentals is not purely observational. For the realities the artist records are processed and transformed by the pressure of his observing mind. Art, Sloan says, springs from an interest in life, but it isn't art if it ends there. Instead, art is the result of a creative impulse derived out of a, conscien a consciousness of life and always subject to the mental control of the artist. That transformative aspect of the making of the work allows Sloan to imagine for it a social role that's different to the overtly political function that he reserved for his graphic work, most famously in the socialist journal, The Masses. He wrote, they say that art is a luxury, but I really believe that people should turn to the artists. I believe the work of artists, poets, musicians, is a kind of food for starving souls as necessary as food for the body. Why should we worry about feeding bodies if they have starving souls? Such a social role for art, achieved by virtue of its capacity to define and express life's, uh, life as idea, to reflect on it rather than merely to transcribe or record its appearance, and to provide a spiritual sustenance to the modern subjects whose lives he delineates, gives Sloan's depictions of New York a distinct atmosphere and quality. Art historians are sometimes inclined to tell the socialists Sloan off for failing to contribute to an authentically radical revolutionary painting, as one a commentator has written, and to point to his decision to make political images largely only in his graphic work and not in his paintings as evidence of somehow a betrayal. I was never interested in putting propaganda into my paintings, said Sloan for his own part. I saw the everyday life of the people, and on the whole, I picked out bits of joy in human life for my subject matter. I picked out bits of joy in human life for my subject matter. Sloan's view of art then is of, as compensation, food for starving souls, without any obligation or necessity for action in the world, but capable of ameliorating the sufferings of that world by presenting this element of joy through the depiction of the richness of observed and experienced life. 
the closeness and intimacy of individuals, the gentle cultivation of pleasure, or the energy of popular life. This is Sloane's hairdresser's window of 1907. John Dos Passos begins his great work of combined fiction and reportage USA, published in 1938, but of course begun much earlier, with an image of rapid movement through the nighttime streets of the city. The young man walks fast by himself through the crowd, writes Dos Passos. Feet are tired from hours of walking, eyes greedy for warm curve of faces, answering flicker of eyes, the set of a head, the lift of a shoulder, the way hands spread and clench. Importantly, the city in this account is a physical thing, a sequence or flow of experience that runs through the body and makes itself felt in the blood and sinew. The young man, Dos Passos again, is searching through the crowd with greedy eyes, greedy ears, taut to hear. I don't want to assert any close identity between Dos Passos and the Ashcanners, but the novelist's account does help us see, I think, that the Ashcanners New York is already physical in this way. Sloan painted the crowd many times. This is a wonderful picture, election night of 1907. It makes use of the licensed reprieve from social constraints allowed when people gathered in front of newspaper offices to watch the results of elections projected on the building signs. For the Ashcan scholars Robert Snyder and Rebecca Zurier, interpreting Sloan, this is a liberating moment. In a city, they write, especially during special moments of celebration, one can expect to be jostled and not minded. This is what uh, the great writer Elias Canetti describes in his, his study Crowds and Power of 1960, when he observes that it is only in a crowd that we are released from the fear of the touch of other people. In the dense crowd in which body is pressed to body, we are paradoxically at ease. As soon as a man has surrendered himself to the crowd, writes Canetti, he ceases to fear its touch. a sort of joke, Beach at Coney Island by Bellows of 1908-10, when as soon as a man has surrendered himself to the crowd, he ceases to fear its touch. This is perhaps why Sloan sees the isolation of the humiliated woman in 6th Avenue and 30th Street, where I began, as so unsettling. The impulse of his art is towards using the observation of others as a means of achieving identity with them, of assembling a crowd through art where the fear of intimacy is dissolved, and where proximity can thus feed the starving souls of individuals. The Ashcan as New York is a physical city, a metropolis where contact, proximity, the liberation and constraint of the body is the dominant metaphor and driver for social experience. Sloan's comment about food for the soul can be understood in this way. Joy, in Sloan's sense, is substantially a physical thing, and it is a physical intensity within the crowd that appears in Sloan's depictions of the popular culture of early 20th century America, like movies Five Cents of 1907 or Reganeski's Saturday Night of 1912, or so one might posit. Sickert's London, like the New York of the Ashcan School, was an iconic city of modernity. The most interesting, beautiful, and wonderful city in the world to me, wrote H.G. Wells in a not untypical summary in 1911, echoing remarks of Sickert's, in fact, which are almost identical and predate it by about 20 years. The centre of a still flourishing commercial and political empire that spread out over both hemispheres, London's role as the leading exemplum of social change and transformation made it a compelling subject for those who set out to make a painting of, con of modern life as a conscious programme. It has been argued that Sickert is the English painter who first articulates a characteristically modernist view of this environment, of the metropolis as symbolic of the complexity and opacity of modern social life and its evolution, the shifting in class, gender and personal relations, the reconfiguration of areas of the city into new social and imagined forms through the networks and spectacles of popular entertainment and everyday existence within the metropolis. But if this is so, Sickert persistently complicates that articulation of social realities by quite deliberately subordinating content to technique. Sickert, on the whole, does not talk in his voluminous writings about life. He speaks a lot about technique, discusses the aesthetic emotion, muses on the exigencies of the, of the market, and talks about the laws of supply and demand. What he does not do is attribute the value of art to its capacity to engage with or to represent life. Turner was painting from his own divine and extraordinary spirit, is a typical remark. He was doing it out of his own head. What is significant is this inward cultivation of meaning 
and its expression in what Sickert called a suave and beautiful execution. The real subject of a picture or a drawing, he wrote, is the plastic facts it succeeds in expressing. And all the world of pathos, of poetry, of sentiment that it succeeds in conveying is conveyed by means of the plastic facts expressed. Sickert's depictions of music halls after 1906 shift their attention from earlier views of Duggaresque action on stage through the mediating screen of the audience and the orchestra pit. This is the pit at the old Bedford Music Hall, about 1889. And now concentrate, after 1906, on the audience itself. Noctes in Brosiani of 1906, and Brosial Nights, features the crowd of watchers who filled the halls, staring, gawping, or peering down, transfixed by the invisible action which is unfolding on the stage below. Sickert's audiences become dehumanised, gaping mouths, blank eye sockets, transformed masks of humanity under the glare of the reflected, reflected light and drama of the stage. These loose, shabby and abstracted figures are transported by the tinsely brilliance of the setting, uh, into, of the setting into a world of intense visual engagement outside the routines of their everyday lives. And it is, is as figures of the observer of the visual as the expressive focus of modern experience that Sickert seems most interested in them. For Sickert, I think, the detached observer's stance opens up the possibility of diagnosis, of understanding and evaluating the complexity and dark uncertainties of the new moral and social spaces created by the modernity of the city. And that view of himself as a detached observer is uh, endemic in Sickert and visible here, the painter in his studio, 1907, you don't see him, you see the acting arm. Watching the watchers, Sickert declares the artist's own powers of comprehension and definition, disciplining of the world into the order and control of paint. Popular culture stands for him for the earthy and disquieting realities of the city that this act of observation through painting coerces into meaning. It is Sickert's own starving soul that is, a, that is suckered here rather than those of the social actors he depicts. In contrast, the Ashcanner's depictions of modern entertainment or street culture, this is Lux the Spielers of 1905, are concerned with the social impulse of both audience and performers, who are allowed to form a unity, as with the sodality of girls who cluster around the vaudeville machines in Sloane's Fun, One Cent of 1905, or the drinkers in a downtown bar, Glackens again, direct as always, a headache in every glass, 1903-04. Finally, Sickert's depiction of modern life is colder and less invested in the human intimacy of his subject matter than is the case for Sloan or, I think, for Ashcan art generally. For Sickert, the crowd of others in the city, whether engaged in the rituals of popular entertainment or caught in some agonistic and intense private communion, this is very British, off to the pub, 1912, are symbols of modernity which can be observed and controlled by that act of looking, by cold, distant and evaluative observation. For the Ashcanners, looking in contrast seems a way of asserting identity with the crowd, of deriving from its careless and intense abandonment of our atomized identity and its passionate physical expression of energy and promise, the materials for an evocation of the positive, the vivid, vital and forceful life that feeds the starving soul. Now, it would be possible, I think, on the basis of a comparison like the one I've suggested, to dismiss Sloan as essentially soft-centred, too full of the milk of human kindness to allow a proper analysis of the city, either politically or socially. And I'm not saying that, but I think it's, it's there, actually, in some of the literature. The cultivation of joy and energy through the crowd and its conversion to some spiritual substance which mitigates or defrays the cost of modern life might appear unsustainable and even self-deceiving. Sickert, on the other hand, might, if we really wish him to be, appear as an altogether tougher prospect levelling a coolly analytical gaze on the realities of life and transforming that penetrating look into the materials of a plastic art that embraces distance as a strategy for understanding. And yet I don't think that it, that does either, either Sloan or the other Ashcanners justice. And it certainly glides over some of the difficulties one must confront in Sickert, whose vision of the modern city is far from unproblematic as a mode of engagement with the lives of those who live within it. The idea I floated earlier of the physical city perhaps offers a correction or, a, or an inflection of the way of, of this way, to this way of looking at the Ashcan-Sickert comparison. 
It may be that if social realism in the crusading, politically committed version of that phrase is not what we can expect from the Ashkan painters, we offered something instead of equivalent value, a vision of the physical city, Dos Passos's greedy eyes and ears, sinew and blood pulsing in rhythm to the life of the streets. And there are other versions of Ashkan painting to Sloan's where this physicality takes on a different and more ferocious aspect. Bellows' Pennsylvania Station excavation of 1909 is a picture to make rose water idealism shiver and evaporate, according to a contemporary commentator. And the audiences in his stag at Sharkey's, 1909, bear out his comment that the watchers at such matches struck him as a lot more immoral than the fighters themselves. There's both identification with the actors here and a sense of the grim realities of social life in the tenements and dives of the city, the necessary dark obverse of its energy. Ashcan painting aims to transverse, I think, uh, on occasion the distance between these damaged transactions and the celebration of the urban spirit under demanding conditions. This is Sloane's turning off the light of 1909. For all the vividness of his evocations of lodging house interiors or depictions of heedless audiences, Sickert seems patrician in comparison, and his subject matter held at an analytic distance that sharply divides him from the warmth and immediacy cultivated by Sloane is more clearly the occasion for the manipulation of plastic facts, things that can be controlled and, as he said, bridled and ridden, more readily than the teeming alien crowd of others to which he was attracted which seemed to him to express the essence of contemporary modernity in the city and by which he was consistently repulsed. Writing this uh, and working for it, I found Sickert and the Ashkanas drifting further apart. What have often been suggested as similar themes and interests, to me anyway, turn out to be more distant, less similar, um, and I think more illuminating than I suspected. Thank you. Okay, may I first of all say how pleased I am to be here to present uh, uh, the first and tentative, I should stress, results of my research on Piero and America, uh, present them to an American public, no less. This is the first time. And uh, uh, for this very reason, I shall be especially, uh, I'm especially look forward to any criticisms, comments, suggestions that you may have. May I also express my sincere gratitude to the Terra Foundation for the fellowship which has enabled me to do a research which really I can only do here. So thank you. Piero della Francesca now ranks among the major personalities of the history of art. However, modern interest in his work is relatively recent. After his death in 1492, he was much neglected by critics. This was for a number of reasons. Because little was known about him, because most of his works are to be found in out-of-the-way places like Arezzo, San Sepolcro, and Urbino, but most of all because his austere and dramatic style was out of keeping with dominant aesthetic preferences. Piero's figures were perceived as being wooden and expressionless. They perform extraordinary deeds or witness exceptional occurrences without displaying any emotion. The three angels on the left of the baptism take part in so crucial an event with a calm that borders on indifference. In the foreground of the flagellation are represented three mysterious characters who appear to be totally unconcerned by the flogging of Christ, which unusually takes place in the background. In a scene of the Arezzo frescoes depicting the battle for the reappropriation of Jesus' cross, a soldier thrusts his dagger into the throat of his opponent with disconcerting impassiveness. I have for the past few years been researching on Piero's writing fortunes, focusing especially on the master's reputation in Britain, the British being uh, his earliest appreciators outside Italy. And four major works by Piero entered British collections between 1837 
1861. I propose to dwell a little on Piero's early fortunes in Britain to place what I shall say about the artist's impact on American art into some context and because comparisons are always helpful. Piero's revival in Britain was part and parcel of some art lovers' enthusiasm for the so-called primitives, namely the art of the early Renaissance. This art came to be revered because its simplicity suggested deep spirituality, piousness. But Piero also appeared to some for his classical qualities. The Arezzo battle scenes, for instance, evoked the Elgin marbles, which had been acquired by the British Museum. Piero's reputation grew especially in the early decades of the 20th century in the wake of modernist aesthetics. Post-impressionism and cubism predisposed the public to appreciate Piero's emphasis on geometric order, his primitive imagery, and his reliance on mass, light, and color rather than line. The British art world was introduced to modernism by the Bloomsbury Group, whose members included, as is well known, Virginia Woolf, the artist Duncan Grant, and Vanessa Bell, Virginia's sister, and the theoretician Roger Fry. Roger Fry organized in 1910 and 1912 two post-impressionist exhibitions which introduced the British art public to the works of Van Gogh, Gauguin, Seurat, and especially Cézanne. And it was Fry's appreciation of Cézanne that led him to discover Piero. The two artists shared a number of features, such as the simplification of compositions into abstract forms, the monumental quality of the figures, and their primitivism. Now, I'm not suggesting direct influence. In fact, uh, it is extremely unlikely that Cezanne knew Piero. Piero. Uh, incidentally, throughout his paper, uh, the modern painting will uh, generally be placed to the left of the screen or above it, and the Piero painting to the right or below. Fry, Fry's formalist theories uh, greatly influenced Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell, um, who uh, frequently sought inspiration from his work. Uh, what you see here is uh, Duncan Grant's Lemon Gathers and uh, Bell's, Vanessa Bell's Studland's Beach, which is based on the Madonna della Misericordia. Um, now, there's no doubt that it is based on that. I mean, uh, Vanessa Bell painted it a year after the visit to Italy, to, uh, to Urbino, and she writes a letter to uh, Virginia Woolf, her sister, saying that, that Piero is the most wonderful thing she's ever seen. So I'm painting by Piero, the flagellation in particular. The painters of the British school at Rome, which is the equivalent of the American Academy in Rome, were also greatly influenced by Piero. The school's main aim in the early decades of the last century was a study of art with the intention of fostering classicism. The students were encouraged to travel widely to seek inspiration from antiquity and the Renaissance. Visits to Arezzo, San Sepolcro, and Urbino to see and copy Piero were de rigueur. I spent a term in the British School at Rome and I saw all kinds of uh, references and paintings and documentation on this, proving this. As a result, when these Rome-trained artists were commissioned decorations for public buildings in Britain, they often produced murals in a strongly Piero-esque flavor. This painting depicting the agreement for the union of England and Scotland, which Tom Monington executed in 1926 for the Palace of Westminster, the British Parliament, derives from the Queen of Sheba scene in Arezzo. This mural representing Queen Elizabeth I visiting her arms, painted by Alfred Lawrence in Chelmsford County Council in 1939, is based on the victory of Constantine. This fresco entitled No Change, No Change meaning the rate of exchange has not been changed, which Monington painted for the Bank of England, was inspired by the flagellation. It's easy to see why Piero appealed to these academic artists. His imagery is majestic and classically serene. It is also serious, unemotional, disciplined, rigorous, and parsimonious. As a result, it was entirely suited to institutions such as Westminster and the Bank of England. <laughs> Elsewhere in Europe, 
Pierre appeal to many modernist art movements, the surrealists, for instance, who were particularly attracted to the enigmatic looks, the hieratic stillness, I recently decided to turn my attention to Piero's influence on American art. This seems to me, seemed to me a natural development. I should recall that Roger Fry was, from 1905 to 1910, curator of paintings at the Metropolitan Museum. Moreover, many American artists, collectors, and critics were greatly in interested in both Italian art and European modernism. Visits to Europe, especially to Paris, of course, provided opportunities to study and seek inspiration from the art of the past and present. And it's worth noting that by 1936, there were in the States five Pieros, more than anywhere else, many, anywhere else in the world apart from Italy. And they included Hercules, which was acquired by Isabella Stewart Gardner in 1908, and this Madonna and Child with Angels, which was bought by Robert Sterling Clark in, sorry, Ah, right. Uh, sorry. Robert uh, Clark, Sterling Clark, in 1913. This was originally in London. It arrived in London in 1830. It was later acquired by the Clark. The earliest American artists I've come across whose work shows Piero's impact is uh, Charles Demuth. Demuth visited Paris in the 1910s, where he frequented the avant-garde, his earlier output was influenced by post-impressionism, cubism, and primitivism. Cezanne made a particularly strong impression on him. Some of the works he produced, especially after his Paris period, but also in the early 30s, feature echoes from Piero's paintings. And I'm referring to the series of watercolors, some of which are in this museum, the Smithsonian, depicting soldiers, sailors, and naked men in Turkish baths. The tight grouping of three standing figures, some of whom are depicted, as in this case, with arms akimbo, allude to the three mysterious figures in the foreground of the flagellation. But let's look at this erotic painting of 1918, entitled Turkish Bath Theme with Self-Portrait, which depicts three men in a New York public bath which was frequented by homosexuals. Demos seems to uh, turn to the flagellation as a model because the idea of three characters casually standing in the foreground, totally oblivious to the significant scene occurring in the background, suited his purpose. The significant scene in the background of Demos' picture is two men making intimate contact. Though I found no references to Piero in the Demos' literature, circumstantial evidence seems to support the view that he was acquainted with the artist. While in Paris, Demos associated with the collectors of avant-garde art, Gertrude and Leo Stein, who were Piero enthusiasts and friends of Berenson. Piero also made a uh, strong impact on several muralists of the 1930s and 40s. And an important and influential figure is John Norton, whose style was characterized by the use of flattened color, abstraction of form, and simple compositions unencumbered by non-essential detail. The Armory Show of 1913, which not notably included modernist paintings, and the works of Mexi Mexican muralists were no doubt major influences on him, but so was Piero, whose Norton, whom Norton discovered in 1930 in London when he visited the spectacular Italian art exhibition at the Royal Academy, which the fascist regime organized for obvious propaganda purposes. The show featured five Pieros, including the extremely fragile flagellation. The murals which uh, uh, Norton painted after his return from London show the impact which the Renaissance artist had on him. Take this series, which Norton painted in 1930 for the exchange room of the new Chicago Board of Trade building. The frontal depiction of the figure, her impassive look, the stylized tubular folds of her garments, the merely hinted protrusion of the left knee, all suggest that Norton's model was a Madonna della Misericordia. Piero and other Quattrocento masters, eh, Masaccio and so on, 
also inspired these frescoes entitled Old South and New South, which depict majestic and simply designed figures. And they were executed in 1932 for the Jefferson County Count Courthouse, Courthouse in Birmingham, Alabama. A more precise Piero Acre is to be found in this 1932 mural called The Old River, which decorates Ramsey Courthouse at St. Paul, Minnesota. The bearded figure pressing both hands on the oar is based on a detail from the Arezzo Fresco. Actually, it's, an, it's a famous detail because Vasari uh, stresses how wonderful this is. And I have the feeling that a lot of artists looked at Vasari and were influenced in their choice of, uh, of details which they uh, wanted to imitate. Norton died in 1934, just before he could contribute to the federal art project. Some of his pupils, however, were involved in these schemes and I should like to dwell especially on Tom Lee, who's, whom Norton considered his most gifted student. Looking at his work, it becomes apparent that Piero was a major influence. Take this Pass of North mural, which was painted in 1938 in the federal courthouse at El Paso, Texas. It depicts in heroic fashion the protagonist of the history of the town the soldier, the conquistador, the pioneer, the friar, etc. The frieze-like arrangement of the figures, their calm and noble grandeur, and the subdued colors are clues that he's seen and appreciated Piero. Note the cowboy on horseback with pointing gesture and flag, which has been represented in perfect profile. It is a direct borrowing from the victory of Constantine. On the left. Lee's acquaintance with his fresco is documented. In a published interview, he explained that while in Paris in 1933, he bought a monograph, a monograph on Piero, and he then decided to travel to Arezzo, and was so impressed with Piero's murals that he acquired a set of Alinari prints of the cycle. But the work that influenced his most is undoubtedly the resurrection, as his paintings show. That's a picture of his wife. Um, and this one. Lee is, incidentally, President George W. Bush's favorite artist. <laughs> and a large painting of his hangs in the Oval Office. Now, I presume he likes his works because they mostly depict Texan cowboys, not because of Lee's Piero-esque style. <laughs> And we can safely assume that Lee's White House cowboys are of traditional nature rather than of the Brookback Mountain variety. <laughs> now, I'm giving a lecture in, in Borgo San Sepulcro, which is Piero's hometown, in two weeks' time, and I shall tell them about the American connection. I'm sure they'll be thrilled to know that Piero is, has had Im impact as far as, as Texas, and of course, a bit of Piero is in the White House. They'll be very impressed, I'm sure. Another little-known but interesting WPA artist who clearly much admired Piero is Ethel Magafen. This mural entitled Cotton Pickers, painted in 1940 for Wynn's post office in Arkansas, is based on the Queen of Sheba scene of the Arezzo frescoes. Ethel Magafen had visited Italy shortly earlier when her sister Jenny, also an artist, won a scholarship to spend a year in Italy. And I haven't, of course, forgotten Philip Guston. But since much has already been written on Piero's influence on his work, I shall limit myself to showing you this 1973 painting, which names him as one of his favorite artists. It is no doubt, it is not difficult to see why Piero appealed to several New Deal muralists. His figures are serious, solemn, calm, and larger than life. As such, they were perfectly in keeping with the social realist aesthetics of artists who sought to exalt factory workers, farmers, and other lowly categories of people. Piero was also an ideal model to follow because his images are clear and rational and thus well suited to fulfill didactic purposes. The socially committed muralists of the WPA program are not the only ones to have sought inspiration from Piero before the Second World War. Two other group of artists who fell under his spell are the Precisionists and the Magic Realists. 
So precisionists who focus on industrial architecture and mechanical subjects that were reduced to abstract qualities found in Piero's geometric forms his sparing use of detail, the thoughtful arrangement of motifs, and the crystal clear light an appropriate model to follow. Most of them became acquainted with the artist during trips to Italy. Schiller is documented to have seen the retro frescoes in 1908 during his third European visit. Elsie Drakes went to San Sepolcro during her extended stay in Italy, 1922-24, after hearing Leo Stein speak enthusiastically about Piero. She's written an essay on uh, her discovery of Piero um, uh, in the 1920s. It was published in the 1970s. It would be pointless to seek in the works of precisionist artists specific references to the Renaissance painter. His influence on them was generic. He taught them an approach, a way of looking at the world, for more precise references to Piero, we will have to turn to the magic realist. Magic realism started in the 1930s and was inspired by new objectivity and surrealism. Two members of the movement that equally interest me, especially interest me, sorry, are Jared French and George Tucker. Sharp focus and emphasis on stillness and geometric compositions, the absence of emotion, a sense of mystery and nostalgia are some of the characteristics of their styles. French, this is a French painting, French uh, death of, uh, uh, to Piero is especially evident in this picture entitled Mallorcan Quarry, which he painted in 1932 during a stay in Europe, which enabled him to discover the work of Piero, among other artists. The picture is based on the resurrection. Note the central figure with his left foot resting on a step and the sleepy figure on the right. This work, called Washing the White Blood from Daniel Boone, <laughs> is a reworking of the baptism. Here, Boone has been substituted for Jesus and surrounded by American Indians to depict an initiation ceremony. I think it's ironical that Piero, who used to be scorned because he was considered uh, a cold fish, you know, wooden and cold, should have been used by so many 20th century artists as a source for erotic pictures. Piero appealed to George Tucker, especially on account of the monumentality of the figures and their careful spatial arrangement. This picture called Island, the Island, 1946, is based on the baptism, as the tied group of three figures, the landscape and the dove indicate. And so is this figure, sorry, this picture, called Market, which he painted in 1949 just after um, a four-month trip to Italy. As the examples we've looked at indicate, visits to Italy, to Europe, sorry, played a crucial part in American artists' discovery of Piero. But it is legitimate to speculate that the curricula of art institutions, such as the Art Student League and Harvard, may have provided the initial stimuli that led some young artists to seek out Piero in faraway places uh, such as San Sepolcro and Arezzo, but this is something I'm yet to investigate. Though my paper is supposed to focus on the 1930s and 1940s, may I end it by drawing your attention to some very recent images, or fairly recent images, that will give you some idea of the connection between Piero and American culture. I shall begin with some paintings by David Hockney, Hockney is, of course, British, but it is uh, especially after he moved to the States in the late 1960s that he, his art became strongly affected by Piero. Uh, this painting entitled uh, Looking at Pictures on the Screen, 1977, actually features a picture of the baptism on the screen. This one, depicting an American collector's home, is based on the nativity. Commenting on this painting of his, Hockney explained that he naturally turned to Piero's abstract compositions as a model when he settled in California because of the modernity of uh, the California architecture and because of the blue skies, which reminded him of Italy. These Californian scenes may also have been inspired by Piero. We'll never know, it's possible, I think it's possible. The next picture I want to show you is totally different. It is a photograph which appeared in an English news quality newspaper, The Independent, in January 1989. 
showing George Bush posing with Dan Quayle and their respective wives before the Lincoln Memorial after winning the election. No doubt hundreds of pictures were taken on that occasion. The Independent, which is well known for the thoughtful use of its photographs, may have chosen this particular one, which depicts the leaders frontally, directly beneath Lincoln's arms, in order to evoke the image of the Madonna della Misericordia. <laughs> the aim, I would argue, was to ironically express a wish that these leaders may seek inspiration from Lincoln's enlightened principles, just as the citizens of Borgo San Sepolcro sought guidance from the Madonna. My last image <laughs> features on the cover of a book I found in a Washington bookstore two weeks ago. <laughs> the volume entitled Ciao America, an Italian discovers the US is a semi-serious account of American life written by the Washington-based correspondent of an Italian newspaper. Piero's portrait of the Duke of Urbino has been used to represent the Italian, and it is assumed, obviously, that this image will be immediately recognizable by the general public here. Do we need further evidence that Piero has made it over here too? <laughs>
in terms of um, how he represented that kind of use of tempera. I just think it's something perhaps yes. worth exploring. I'm, I'm very grateful for this yeah. comment, because in fact, uh, when I think of England, for example, there were, at the beginning of the 20th century, a so-called tempera society, essentially laid paraphilized, and they, uh, they were all into Piero for some reason. They associated tempera and the fresco technique you know, to Piero, and, and I think this humility, they're all Christians as well. So this humility, if you like, of the medium uh, uh, also led them to Piero in a, way, in a more, more or less direct way. Although Thank you. I can tell a funny anecdote about this. When Ben Sean exhibited his Sacco and Vanzetti series in 1931, Francis, is that right? At 32, thank you, at the Downtown Gallery in New York, and he used tempera and gouache and, um, and framed them in these very folkish kind of ways. He framed them himself, and he was expecting kind of working class Italian audience to come and buy up all the paintings, and um, it turned out that the folks who did come and see them from different unions and um, many from Italian working class backgrounds hated the paintings, thought they were terribly ugly. And uh, it turned out that museums and other collectors purchased them. So, you know, it doesn't mean that just because they were aiming for that, you know, for a different audience that they were actually successful in doing that. But I do know that the choice of, of tempera was very deliberate and, and very much related to to social and class issues. So. Thank you. I hadn't thought of that. Thank you very much for this. Do you have a question over here? Um, yeah. This, I'm Nancy Matthews, and I have a question for David about Sickert's presence in New York during the first decade or thereabouts, or even the teens. Um, I, I agree. I'm not sure he's so closely related to the Ashcan school painters, but he does seem to have a resonance with Hopper, who, if there were a Sickert show or Sickert publicity in New York at that time, Hopper might have mm. seen. Mm. I, mean, I, don't re I don't know for, I, um, for certain. I think there isn't much uh, presence in the US of, of Sickert, and certainly not the, the group of which at this time, briefly but influentially, he's a part, the Camden Town group, which has perhaps some you know, there, there's more to be said about this comparison. And one of the things that, that might be explored is the, the relationship of those two conglomerations or groups of artists, the Ashcanners and the, the Camden Town Group. Um, and certainly uh, that art on the whole, I think, uh, didn't travel. The way this relationship is, is normally talked about is through Shin, in fact. Uh, and through Shin's early, very early, I think 1902, trips to, to Europe, including France and, and Britain. Um, and the very clear uh, compositional relationships I and uh, as well uh, relationships of subject matter in Shin's depictions of music halls and uh, popular performance at that time, which uh, clearly um, owe great debts to Degas. And Degas was, was Sickert's teacher very influential on Sickert, and, and the, the, the Sicketts of the 1880s that deal with, with music halls, for instance, I showed you one, the, the, the orchestra pit at the Old Bedford, adopt and, and work with and develop and evolve in certain ways um, the Degas-esque Degar, compositional device of seeing the action on the stage through um, the audience or through the orchestra. Um, and you can see those compositional devices being taken up and worked with and adopted in Shin as well. Um, Sigurd was out of the country, in, out of Britain, in, uh, in Europe during, during the period that, that uh, Shin visited, but he was back and forth. Um, so the, the tantalizing possibility always has been that there might have been some moment of, of personal contact. Certainly, there's every reason to assume that, that Shin saw some Sigurds, but whether he's taking that uh, compositional uh, device and working with it from Sickert or directly from Degas, and almost certainly the latter, um, that, then that, that set, the sort of possibility, set of possibilities is, is slightly obscured. I, very interesting. It's something that I, I would actually be interested in looking at to see the ways in which Sickert, uh, Sickert's reputation, if it existed and what it, ex what it was in the US, would I think be a fascinating um, topic to take up. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly through Roger Fry, mm -hmm. maybe just on a personal basis, not an exhibition, yes. but just a personal 
Okay. Well, instinct yeah. suggests that that would be, uh, if Fry were, were talking about Sicket, that would be later. Um, they wouldn't have known each other at the time. Yes, they, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's later that, that Bloomsbury has a, a brief sort of, uh, well, a set of, of quite interesting relationships with, with Sickert, with, including uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, famous uh, uh, Walter Sickert Conversation, which is a very um, intelligent and probing uh, discussion of Sickert's art uh, within the context of Bloomsbury aesthetics. Mm -hmm. But th those things happen, happen later on. Thanks very much, Nancy. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but a major collection of Walter Sickert's work has just been given or is a promised gift to the Fogg Art Museum uh, by uh, Patricia Cornwell, who's a crime writer. Perhaps you've read her work. And she's been collecting it, and she came up with a novel and a theory that uh, Walter Sickert is Jack the Ripper. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you think of that, David. Uh, but uh, there is this large group of 82 works that is at the Fog Art Museum. They're analyzing well, it in their conservation area. There is, uh, there is, yes. I mean, it's wonderful, actually, the Cornwall, who has um, not destroyed, but, but has uh, allowed certain invasive procedures on some of the Sickert that she bought during her work for, for the book that she published on Sickert as the Ripper, um, lifting paint surface and so forth. And in fact, according to my sources, at one point going round to the Whistler collection in Glasgow with a team of, of forensic scientists and attempting to take DNA from the backs of stamps uh, <laughs> that, uh, on letters that Sickert had sent to Whistler. Um, there's a, there's a, I mean, Matthew Sturgis in his biography of Sickert does a very good job, I think, in, in tackling Cornwall's charges about Sickert and, and showing how historically incredible they are. But there is a serious, there is a serious point here, which is, is connected with my discussion, um, which had to be compressed because of the, the time of uh, constraints of the, of the paper, uh, of Sickert as dispassionate observer and of the observer and as the watcher and, and so forth, and the con contrast with that and some at least of the ash cameras, mainly, mainly Sloan, which is that, that Sickert's, um, if you like, voyeurism um, and mobilization of gaze, the vision, as a principle of control uh, through his subject, his subject matter, which at least in some cases with the bodies of, of working class women who are transformed and deform, deformed in, in Sickert's um, painting uh, in, in the service of that controlling, um, mm. controlling ambition, really. It's as if modernity is okay. replaced by those, the bodies of those women from the working classes, from uh, those uh, areas of London which seem to be areas to Sickert of uh, disorder. Uh, and by transforming through the gaze um, those bodies, he is able to um, at least fantasize a possibility of control for himself. Now, I mean, that's an interesting thing to do with the way in which the modernism of British art invents itself. Um, but it seems to me also, as I was trying to say in the paper, to make a very stark contrast, in fact, with the, the uh, approach to uh, the bodies of... Uh, working class New Yorkers as they appear in Sloan. David, I think in the interest of having a break, I'd like to take one more question. I hope the answer can be fairly brief, but uh, I don't want to cut too short. So could we have one more question? Sure. Um, you know, first, uh, I should praise this session, how, how thrilling it is that scholars outside the U.S. are talking about U.S. artists not as some, solely some way to understand the U.S., but as engaged with modern art or art of their period. And that's kind of a tribute to what the symposium wants to see happening, and it's great that it's starting to happen, so I want to thank all of them. And David, I'll, answer, I'll open a can of worms here, but I think Nancy Matthews helped open it. Your comparison of Sickert and Sloan, you know, one is one way of looking, one is another way of looking, almost invites us, are you asking us to think that one is British and one is American? Do you want oh, to go there? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, or English, I should say English. Uh, that would be a can of worms. Um, is that what you're it wasn't, no, you asking know? No, it wasn't in my mind um, to think of it in quite those terms. I mean, I think there is, you know, well, as far as the English part of this goes. Sickert is, 
I think significant as a important moment in the history of modern British painting that self-consciously sets out to tackle the experience of modernity and to find visual languages in which to express it. Um, and I think because of that importance, that's strategic and, and as it were, as somebody uh, used this term yesterday, narrative importance in, in trying to understand what a history of British, of modernism uh, and modern painting, modern subject matter in Britain might be during those years because of that uh, importance of Sickert, then um, there is a certain sense in which one can speak of Sickert's importance to English painting. Yeah, But I wouldn't want to, and how far one can make that sort of, how far one, one would wish to position the Ashcan School or Sloan in such a narrative, um, I don't feel confident to say, actually. I don't think at the moment. Um, um, but I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to make claims that were any more, certainly no more essential than that, 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 that there are clearly different cultural histories, there are different unfoldings of the attempts to tackle the experience of modernity. And this was, was something that was raised as well in the first paper we heard this afternoon. They, these things are clearly specific and they have narratives that are in part to do with, with the unfolding in particular sets of institutional and cultural circumstances in particular places. Sickert certainly has a role in such a narrative and such an understanding. Um, but I don't think beyond that that there is any essential, I wouldn't want to say, or feel it, actually feel it useful to say. I wouldn't feel it, that it would tell us anything significant to say beyond that. Sorry, you said big brief, didn't you? And I'm not. <laughs> uh, no, you agree. Um, uh, I don't think there's anything beyond that that would be helpful, helped by such an expression. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.